Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anna Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Terrell Schrock. Terrell is an independent researcher with field experience working on several Bantu, Eastern Nilotic, and Kuliak languages in Uganda. He has written a grammar and a dictionary of the Kuliak language Ik. Terrell is currently studying Ik etymology for clues for, to a better understanding of the relationship of Kuliak to other East African language families and its historical interactions with them. So please join me in welcoming Terrell as he gives his talk, non contiguous met metathesis in Ik and its implication for East African etymology. Terrell, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna, for that introduction, and good morning or good evening to those of you who have joined. Thank you for joining us here, wherever you are on this planet. I'm with you from the state of Florida, so it's morning for me. Anna already introduced me and the talk, so I won't say much more about that now, and we'll go ahead and jump right into it. My goals for this talk today are as follows. Number one, to give a brief refresher of what metathesis is. I imagine we all know what it is, but just a brief refresher. Number two, to give some examples of synchronic metathesis in Ik. Three, give some examples of diachronic metathesis in Ik. Four, give some examples of metathetic cognate sets across language families. And five, give some conclusions and directions for further study. My overall goal is to show the importance of metathesis for East African etymology. Metathesis defined. Of course, there are many ways to word a definition of metathesis, but here are just three. Ultan 1978 says that metathesis is any transposition of linearly ordered segments, or I'm sorry, elements. Blevins and Garrett 2004 said, metathesis is any reordering of segments or features within the phonological string. Canfield 2015, metathesis is the phonological phenomenon in which output segments do not have the same linear ordering as the corresponding segments in the input. So that's a bit more of a theoretically oriented definition. And the first and most obvious point, metathesis happens. For example, I myself, after nearly four, four decades speaking English, I still reversed the V and L in the word cavalry. Up until recently, I was saying Calvary. So there we can see that the liquid L, it is transposed to come before the V in Calvary. That is metathesis. My, my grandmother often was heard saying revelant when she meant relevant. Here the, the liquid and the, and the uh, fricative have transposed, they have exchanged places. And then George W. Bush Jr., a former president of the United States, was often heard saying nuclear when he meant nuclear. So here the liquid and the vowel after the liquid have switched places. These are all examples of synchronic metathesis in modern English. And I won't go into it now, but metathesis has played an important role in the development of English historically as well. So I just wanna give a few background um, typologies of metathesis before we get into the data. Ultan 1978, his categories of metathesis are as follows. Number one, the transposition of syntactic constituents. So in his broader definition, metathesis can apply to syntax as well. For example, in the English question formation, going from he was here to was he here? And there the words are, 
they exchange places. Number two, the transposition of syllables. For example, in the Spanish slang, when tema is substituted for mate. Forgive me if I pronounced that wrong. I don't speak Spanish. Number three, the transposition of sounds or segments. For example, in the Spoonerism, a row of weary benches becomes a row of beery wenches. Number four, the transposition of supersegmental features. For example, tone or paradigmatic stress as in import versus import. And then five, transposition of phonological features as when in Greek, the feature aspiration is moved. Uh, for example, when thrix uh, is contrasted with trikos, there the aspiration has moved from um, the coronal onset to the, um, to the velar sound. Then Blevitt and Garrett's 2004 typology. Here are some different parameters. On the left column there, we have the type of metathesis. And then the, the second column is the phonetic feature affected. And then the third column is the distance that the you know, distance of movement. And on the right column are some examples in, in their work. So with perceptual metathesis, some sounds like liquids, nasals, and other sounds have a tendency to bleed into surrounding sounds. And this can go quite a long distance at times. And the result is that the hearer may have trouble perceiving the order of segments because of the bleeding of features. The second line is compensatory metathesis. And the phonetic feature there is stress-induced shifts within a, a foot or a meter. And their uh, segments may be misperceived, um, not misperceived, things may be rearranged within the word to better suit the, the um, stress patterns of the language. The third line, we have co-articulatory metathesis and the, the feature affected is consonant, consonant co-articulation. These are adjacent stop consonants. Um, when there are co-articulated consonants, the order of the two consonants may be switched because of the perception that they are being pronounced simultaneously. And then lastly, auditory metathesis. The phonetic feature affected is the auditory stream decoupling, and this is with adjacent stops and syllables for example, in, in late West Saxon, also in modern English with the verb ask, it's often metathesized to be ax. The particular type of metathesis that is at work in ik, in the one that I've been looking at, is non-contiguous metathesis, or what's called by some hyperthesis. And here's just a brief description from Angela Carpenter, 2002. Non-contiguous non metathesis, where the order of non-adjacent segments in a word is switched, is a repair option for a variety of phonologically ill-formed structures. As such, it, it incurs multiple violations of the constraint linearity. Now that's, she's writing from an optimality theory perspective and is thus more typologically marked than local or contiguous metathesis. Some languages allow both local and non-contiguous metatheses, while others only allow local metathesis. My work of late uh, and this presentation is from an eccentric view. I'm studying ic etymology to help me better understand the relationship of Ik and Kuliak to other language families in East Africa. Also the historical interactions between them as we try to investigate the historical development of the peoples of East Africa. And although Ik is not in the Rift Valley per se, it's certainly not in the Tanzanian Rift Valley, 
it is perched on the western rim, the plateau of the Kenyan Rift there in northwest Kenya. And as we've been discovering, Ik and Kuliak are very much implicated in the historical interaction and development of the languages of the Rift Valley, whether they're Bantu, Nilotic, um, Hadza, Sandawe, and Cushitic. Okay, moving on now to syn synchronic metathesis in Ik, type one. The Ik verb to be long or tall is zikibon. But when I was living in the Ik area and studying the language, I occasionally heard this verb pronounced as gisibon. This was my very first clue years ago of metathesis in the, in the Ik language. So on the right there, I have possible cognates, I don't know if they are or not, for both forms. So for example, Zikaba in, in Dulai and Gudup in Hamar. Semantically, all these forms are, are quite close, obviously. So there we have Zikibon and Gisibon. And then the second verb to come down, Kidzimeton, and sigimeton. And on the right, I have two possible cognates. I don't, again, I don't know if they are, but I've just been scanning all the possibilities in trying to understand also which of the two forms, the non inverted one and the inverted one, is somehow canonical or original. And all I can say is that impressionistically, the first of the two pairs, Zikibon and Kidzimeton, seem to be the canonical forms, and Gisibon and Sigimeton seem to be the result of metathesis. And I make that conclusion based on the fact that they were heard less frequently overall. And when I would ask Ik speakers about it, it seemed to me that this alternation was below the threshold of their awareness, uh, such that the question when I asked them didn't seem to compute, which is itself an interesting uh, fact about what metathesis is doing. Okay, ich synchronic metathesis types two through four. Well, let me go back to the previous slide and just mention that in this type of metathesis, we in a CVC sequence, we have these sibilants switching places with the velars and the velar you know, dorsal consonants. What's interesting beyond that is that the initial consonant retains the voice quality, voicing. And the second one retains the quality of not being voiced. So even as the, the Z switches places with K, it is devoiced. And when the G switches places with K, I'm sorry, when the K switches places to the front of, this, of the CVC, it is voiced. The opposite arrangement happens here in this verb, but the voicing, this voicing aspect is the same. Um, and so it's hard for me to conclude that, you know, it prefers, let's say, a velar sound to come before a coronal sound because the opposite is happening uh, up here. All right, now going to these instances of metathesis, the verb to be hairy or shaggy in ik is saukumon or gausumon. Here the the um, velar and the coronal again have switched places, but this time this initial coronal is not voiced, so it remains voiceless in both both positions. Uh, but when the the velar k here goes to the front, it is voiced. The second example, to be flabby, reshukumon, is paired with gerusumon. This is a case of like double metathesis. 
And I probably should have put a third form here, an intermediate form, although that form hasn't been attested. Perhaps it was at some point, I don't know. If not, if it's not a two-place metathesis, then it's just an instance of very complex non-adjacent metathesis where we have um, the velar moving you know, two syllables away and this liquid and the sibilant both moving uh, a syllable away. Then this last type here, the word for turaco, fuluguru and gulufuru. Again, long distance metathesis occurring there. And then lastly, synchronically, we have these two types of metathesis. The word for axe head is either na ninging or na ninging in. And for this example, I do not know which one is canonical or original. To be exhausted is either zilamon or zialamon. This could be some type of uh, compensatory metathesis. I don't know which one is canonical or original, but the liquid L has moved to be between these two uh, high tone vowels. Or depending on my analysis, one of the vowels is moved. Well, I guess they switch places, but I, I'm not, I do not know yet the motivation for that type of metathesis either. Now in Turkana, uh, Eastern Nilotic language that borders Ik today and has probably for one or 200 or more years, also shows synchronic metathesis. And let me interject here. When I say synchronic metathesis, what I mean is that the two forms are still synonymous. There's no semantic differentiation happening. So here, the word for mole, nga kemera, or nga kerema. And then it's a tree species, ngi kwa ngoromoka, or ngi kwa ngomoroka. And the word for breast, ekisina, or sorry, esikina, or ekisina. This data is taken from Dimondal's grammar of Turkana, and he writes in that description that there are conditions for metathesis in Turkana, which is that both consonants are sonorant or obstruents, and that the vowels between them are identical. He writes with regard to this that the cognate form in the closely related teso, this is for the word breast, fits with the second form in Turkana, ekisina. This process may therefore have historical comparative relevance. And so that is a preview statement to my presentation today that metathesis must be considered an important phenomenon for us to look at when we're trying to trace the, the contacts and the um, genetic relationships of languages in this area. So in Turkana today, Esikina and Ekisina both mean breasts, but in Teso, a closely related language, Ekisina means breasts. So it's like these two forms have become lexicalized in two different closely related languages to mean the same thing. Now moving on to diachronic metathesis. SVK, KVS, and that's just sort of an abstract uh, formalism, for, formalism for what's to follow here. But what I mean by diachronic is this. In these sets of closely related terms, uh, semantically related, either synonyms, near synonyms, or semantically related, it appears that one or more of the members have been inverted but this is not happening synchronically. These forms are not uh, equally accepted forms for the same meaning today in ik. But it looks like the set was created at some point in the past with the help of metathesis. So that's what I mean by, by diachronic. And because it's diachronic, usually this type of metathesis 
is accompanied by other important sound changes. In this first set of three, we have the, the verb itch, which is suk, the verb scratch or scrub off, sec, and scratch vigorously, kosh. And with these arrows here, I've indicated what I think, you know, and, and is happening. And the bi-directionality of the arrows means I don't know whether this form is the older form or more salient original form. And these are the ones that were inverted or vice versa. So here we have the sibilant coming down, same position. And then, and then the, the root, the CVC root gets flipped. Okay. Then in this group, the word for net or snare is sago. Uh, ik nouns in their lexical form, I hyphenate because when they are used in actual speech, they must take a case ending with no exception. So this is like a more abstract lexical root form. That's why there's a hyphen for the nouns. And then the verb root kotz, which is to be snared. So it looks like to me that metathesis is involved and in, we'll get to that more later. Well, actually we won't get to that specific route, but um, one that's very similar to this. And then in this set, the verb to pile or heap is ituk and the same meaning is also expressed with the verb kits. Now, I know that because of this initial vowel here in ituk, that this is an old Nilo-Saharan root and that this initial vowel was a verbal prefix at some point, but it's been petrified in ik. It has no meaning or function in modern ik. So if my theory is right, these two verb roots result from an older form, uh, which was at some point metathesized in a language whether it was a Kuliak language or another language, I do not know. All right, and then this last set, each, each token has the meaning to gimp or hobble. And here you can see the progression again. Um, itoko, itsukuk, and ngodolom, ngodolom. And I hypothesize that this last form it, um, has been inverted at some point and in some language. Really my overall question that I don't have an answer to is, how does ik and any other language come by sets like this? All right, now the second type of diachronic metathesis which would be a, um, a labial or bilabial followed by a coronal and then having that inverted. Here we have this set having to do with drinking, the verb to drink, wet, sip, it wet, drink like a cow, boot, sip, a boot, and sip, soup. Um, so what I'm considering here is that this last item has been inverted. Here we have the verb to boil, intransitive, wad, and the verb to foam or froth, taboo. Again, it appears to me that metathesis happened in the development of these two closely related words that are not synonymous. Here, the verb to be thin is bedet, and the verb to be undesirably thin is depet transposition of the bilabials and the coronals, this uh, alveolar implosive da. This last set, we have the word for dust, bur, burek, to be mushy or soft, burad, to be mushy or soft, dabud, and the word for mud, doba. This one is a little less clear whether, um, they're actually related, but it's more of a pattern that I'm investigating. Um, and it could be that burad and dabud are the result of metathesis. I don't know about dust and mud, that might be a stretch. 
All right, in this last slide for diachronic metathesis, we have the verb to tear, zer, and then to be shredded or torn, la la ziran, to be tattered, lidzirizan, to be ratty or tatty, resed. So I've found cognates for zer in a wide variety of languages in East Africa. Um, so here we have the same CVC sequence. And then in these last two, it appears that the CVC root was inverted. Lastly, on this side, the verb to pull, yank, lur, to pull back or retract, dol, and to pull back and retract, ruj. Seems to be that metathesis may have created this um, set. Okay, moving on, because time is of the essence, we're getting really to the meat of the presentation. And I see now that I probably have a lot more data than we can get through, but that's not so important. The important thing is to get the overall pattern. And then um, I will welcome your, your thoughts about it. I'm calling this transphylar metathetic etym etyma. What I mean by this is, in ik, I have a pair of words that look like they are inversions of each other, and their semantics are close enough, quite close, in fact. So we have the word the word utzak, which means insect, larva, or worm, and then the the the, the noun tzikak, which means bee or honey. On the left side is a collection of possible cognates. And I'm stressing that because I really don't know. Um, again, my motivation in doing this study originally was basically to answer the question, where do ik words come from? So some of these cognates look quite strong. Uh, this proto-Northern agao, which is Cushitic, the word for worm, I think that's really an unquestioned, not unquestionable, but it's quite strong candidate to be a cognate with Kutz. And then moving down, Barketo, a small worm is Kutz in C. The Proto West Rift Cushitic word for maggots is Quitsana. The Hadza word for millipede is Quitchi. The Ge'ez, so that's Semitic word for worm and moth is Adda, and forgive my pronunciation. Dime, which is emotic. Uh, the word for mosquito is gosu. Northern Mao, also emotic. The word for earthworm is wetske. In Gumus, the word for bee is kacha. Kacha. I don't know the tones. And so on and so forth. When we get down to nilotic, we see that the the pharyngealized consonants or the pharyngealization is lost in, in the last consonant. So we have, for example, proto kalingin kut for worm, proto eastern nilotic for worm, we have kurut, dholua, which is west nilotic, the word for grubs is kudini, and the word for bee and honey is kich. All right, so those look like potential cognates for the ik word kuts. Then we invert the word to get tzik, and then we have another set of potential cognates. The first one here from Proto-Northern Agao, the word for scorpion is tzik. In Tzamako, another Cushitic language, the word for firefly is tzeko. In Sandawe, the word for pure honey is tzegani. The word for a beehive cover is tsuka. And the words for bee and a variety of a honeybee. Um, I forgot to look up. I forgot to brush up on my clicks. So maybe Helen can help with that later. Um, and then moving on down, we have a lagwa, which is Southern Cushitic. We have Yaku, another Cushitic language. Proto Kalinjins, Southern Nilotic. In Ik, there's the word Sukutela, which means hard crystallized honey. The word Lukes means pollen. Uh, 
also having to do with the color yellow. And then in Yaku, we have Diko, yellow honey. And uh, in Proto Bantu, Yiki means bee. And we know from Swahili, for example, Nyuki, and then Ikoma, which is a Mara Bantu language, the word for bee is Choki. Lastly, uh, going much further afield, there is Proto-Indo-European verbs, steak and stike, stike, to sting and to stick, which if they are related to the ik word ik, would involve metathesis of the initial um, affricates as well. Also, the ik has the verbs kids to bite or sting and kut to suck which look close to the word, um, which, you know, it makes sense. Bees sting, um, insects, worms, they sting, bite, and suck. All right, so this is the kind of pattern that I'm dealing with and trying to figure out. We have time to go to at least another one, maybe a couple more. So this is set two. The ik words involved are kweta, meaning arm, hand, or branch and degua, which is foot, leg, or base. The star here in front of degua is to indicate that this is my reconstruction of what I would call old ik. The, the modern ik form of foot is dea without the, the labialized velar, but because um, in other closely related Kuliak languages, the, velar, the labialized velar is there. Um, I have reconstructed old ik or perhaps proto kuliak as degua to complete this nice metathesis with kweta. All right, so looking on the left side here, the ik word for foreleg or forearm is chwet, chweta, and the toposa word for foreleg is kwat. The Maasai word for foreleg is kewat. The Swahili word for hoof is kwato. The Hadza word for branch is awatako. And again, I don't, um, I beg forgiveness for not knowing how to pronounce those. Proto Kalenjin, hind leg is chat. In Kamanda Toga, the word for arm is gadid. And so on, we go down through the line of potential cognates for the ik word kwet, which means arm, hand, or branch. Then on the right side, We have resemblances with the word degua. In Nyangi, which is a Kuliak language, the word for foot and leg is teg. In Yaku, a Kushitic language, the word for arm is teke. And then we go down the list, we have some more Kushitic. We have this bench, bench non form, which is emotic. Um, we have some Dahalo, some more Cushitic, some Proto-Semitic, some uh, Komus. Again, the, the ik word for hoof and root is sok, soko. And of interest, perhaps the last one is a Hadza form for thigh. So we've got arms, we've got limbs, arms, hands, or arms and legs and parts of arms and legs. And then, um, metaphorical extension to branches and, and whatnot. Uh, the Proto-Indo-European root for a joint or a member is lek, which could be where um, the, the, sorry, the English word leg comes from, though it's not certain. Anyway, moving on. Uh, I won't go through the whole list because of time, but here's another metathetic pair in ik. Kol, castrated male goat, rag, castrated male bovine. And then what looks to be, again, there's going to be a percentage of these that turn out not to be cognates. And those of you who are experts in any of the languages that I have included can let me know um, which ones are not to be included. But as a non expert, I'm just going by this uh, CVC form for the time being. Uh, and then over here, we have what look like cognates for the, this form, kol. And semantically, we've got mostly male goats, castrated male goats. We have some bull, ram. There's a she goat here, which could be an antonym 
type situation. Ox, goat. So overall, it is um, semantically quite closely related, perhaps with the exception of the Somali and bony form on the right side, on the meaning being man, although that is still male. Moving on, here's the fourth set. We have quaz, meaning skin, cloth, or leather, and tseg, meaning skin. And then what looked, looked to be cognates for both forms. So in my mind, it's highly unlikely that, well, first of all, in ik, these are not synonyms. Um, well, they kind of are, I guess, but they're not exact synonyms. They're, not, they're near synonyms. But tsegwa, for example, is not used for leather or cloth. But both of them are used for skin. But I would say quaz is a processed skin, and tsegwa is skin of a live animal or human or recently um, dead animal or human. So they're not synonyms. My question is, how did the language get these two if they are, in fact, inversions of a single root. Uh, so on the left side, uh, I don't want to take too much time going through this, but I believe the Proto-Southern Cushitic word quad, meaning goat skin, is a very good candidate to be a cognate. Alaguas foreskin skin, maybe not as good, Burungue. Northern Mao, Hamar, so we've got some Omotic languages here. Uh, we have two Kuliak languages, Nyangi and So, Kuth and Kus. And then again, Bantu, Gode, Godi, and Gozi. Could be coincidence, but perhaps not. And then on the right side, cognates for Tsegwa, the ik word Tsek, meaning to be hairy or bushy. Shak, meat left on a recently skinned hide. Shako, sorry, this should be ikizu. Um, for, so shako, meaning human skin and ikoma, and sakwa, animal skin and ikizu, look very strong. Iseg for datoga, sheepskin, very strong again. Shakwa for burunge, possibly, although body and skin are a little a little bit different. Um, shock, which would be meat on skin in old ik before ik lost these lateral fricatives. Shongong, leather cape in ik. Sang, back cape in so. Sangu, bag or sack in nyole, which is a Bantu language. Shuka, cloak or shawl in Swahili. Um, shag, sackcloth in Datoga. Sak, sackcloth in Hebrew, sakos, sackcloth in Greek, a bit outside of our range. Shokan, fat in Yangi, which is Kuliak. And then in Proto-Northern Aga, we have Sakha and Sagwa, fat and meat. All right, the fifth set, we have these two ik words, Kaba meaning the diaphragm or the, the breastbone in the middle of the chest, and bakutsik, which is chest. This uts, um, I believe, is a, like a nom nominal formative suffix um, that is not, is not productive in ik. Uh, I think it had some, some historical relevance at some time. On the right here, we have cognates for the bak form. We have bak, meaning body in so, Bagu, belly in Afarsaho, Labaka, heart in Proto Northern Agao, Bagama, belly in Dahalo, and Babak, diaphragm in Ma. So you can see there the word diaphragm in Ma, Babak, is an inversion of the word for diaphragm in Ik, Kap. On the left side here, potential cognates for Kab, we have Ik, Kob, which is the navel, the belly button. Gob, which is a knot in wood. Gogomo, which is the breastbone. Um, so I'm sorry, the diaphragm is not the breastbone, it's the muscle underneath it. So gogom is breastbone. 
uh, Gafi Gaf is a lung. And then uh, in Sandawe, the front of the body is hoop. The fetus in the womb is guba. And the placenta is huba. In Proto-Afro-Asiatic, according to Christopher Errett, I believe, um, actually, I shouldn't say that. I don't know if that was Eret or someone else. The word for trunk, like the trunk of a body or a tree, is gub and gob or gob. In the Ari language, the word for navel is gubi. In Dime, emotic, an emotic language, the word for lung is kofchu. Moving on down, bukusu ikoma, these are two Bantu languages. The word for navel in Bukusu, which is spoken in Kenya, is Hofu. And the word for womb, spoken in the Mara language, Ikoma, is Rovi. Possibly the source for those, again, is a Nilotic language like Datoga or Turkana, where we have Kaposht and Kapul. Majang, Majang a Sermic language, the word for chest is kokom, which you can see is very close to the ik word for breastbone, gogom. And then komo, um, I think that's another Sermic language. The word for navel is gumu. How did ik come across, how did ik come by this set, which appear to be inversions of a root? And now it has both of them and they have different but closely related meanings. And here is the first verb that I've introduced um, in this format. The ik word for to be lacking is god, and the word to lack is itak. This initial vowel, again, is supposed to be an early Nilo Saharan uh, verbal prefix that is now frozen in the ik language. All right, so we have this meaning of lack or to be lacking, to be insufficient, to not be enough. And then we have this list of potential cognates uh, for that form. And then on the other side, we have potential cognates for the inverted form. And we can see here the, the idea of not enough, of being tiny, few, small, short, um, and then the same semantics over here, wanting, lacking, being short, being small. And everything. So, because of time, I'm going to wrap up here. Good enough. We were almost through. A few conclusions I draw from the foregoing is that metathesis, because it involves more than one segment and reorders them, can be a highly salient mutation in the evolution of a language's grammar and lexicon. Number two, non contiguous metathesis creates synonyms in ik synchronically. Number three, non-contiguous metathesis, along with other sound changes, seems to have created synonyms and semantically associated terms in ik diachronically. Number four, for the terms on both sides of some ik metathetic inversions, there seems to be large numbers of likely or possible cognates in other East African languages. Number five, to the degree this is true, then metathesis acts as a switch in the railroad lines. So if you know how in a railroad line, they have those switches that um, allow the train to go to the left or to the right in a Y figure. Metathesis acts as a switch like that in, the etym in etymological development, giving us a powerful tool for historical reconstructions. And I close with some questions. So this is where I need to continue my study. Number one, what are the linguistic and or social conditions prompting synchronic metathesis? Number two, where do semantically similar metathetic sets come from? I alluded to this earlier. Is it language internal metathesis that acts as a lexicon building process? And or, is it through borrowing cognates that had or had not already undergone metathesis in source languages? Number three, for large cross-family metathetic CVC cognate sets, did metathesis occur once in an ancient proto-language, which then spread its inverted cognates to other languages? 
and or did metathesis occur haphazardly throughout the historical linguistic development of the region with non-inverted and inverted forms roaming around from language to language and undergoing semantic shifts? Number four, what is the relationship between metathesis and semantic shift? So between uh, phonology, phonological and morphological change and semantic change with regard to uh, metathesis. And lastly, do the languages that you study have metathesis? Did it, does it have synchronic? Does it have diachronic? That is the end of my talk. Questions, comments, or suggestions are welcome. And thank you all very much for listening. Thank you very much for the presentation. So we can start the question and answer section. Now you can either raise your hands and I will give you a turn to unmute or write your question in the chat and I will read it out. Please remember that the webinars are being recorded. So if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and released on the YouTube channel. I see that Bonnie already raised her hand, so I'll go straight there. Hi, Terrell. Thanks for the talk. There's a lot of interesting data there. Hi, Bonnie. It. Well, I have a lot of comments. So let me, I have a, a diachronic one and a synchronic one. So let me just do one and then give someone else a chance to ask. Okay, great. Uh, on the, I have a question. Do you think that intentional inversion is the same as metathesis? I'm thinking about what people might do in, say, youth, urban youth languages where deliberately manipulating syllables. Um, to me, that might be considered a morphological process rather than a phonological one. We tend to think of yes. metathesis as phonology. And in some of those instances, like where you had um, be uh, you know, extremely thin or be mushy, that mm -hmm. to me seemed like cases where you could consider those a creative use of language. Like we're gonna make it sound especially mushy or especially thin by mm. in, inverting it. And it was interesting to me because those words didn't fit the pattern that I was otherwise seeing in your synchronic examples. In, in other words, they, they moved the coronal to the front and most yes. of your other cases moved the dorsal to the front. And I felt that you could sort of handle a lot of those cases with a kind of optimality theory perspective of a preference for dorsal initial, probably left right. edge or left edge syllables and and voicing on the on the left edge. So uh, yes, and even ones like Ziaman from Ziaman that that could be a just a preference for consonants starting syllables or right. consonants starting feet. So you know I think you there that you know the synchronic stuff really really should be a paper all on its own also your modulum example that putting a dorsal at the beginning and yes I, I didn't have time to write what the original on that right. was yeah so that that's my comment on yeah, synchronic stuff so let thank you, respond you. And give yeah a chance. that's that's a really helpful comment so what i hear you saying is that um there will be two possible motivations for inversion. And um, one would be like a preference for certain phonological um, sequences. And the other one would be like a creative, spontaneous. Um, yeah, like look at the literature of these changes in youth languages. And, yes. you know, like why should, I mean, those same creative processes are available for all languages. It, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be restricted to slang or youth language. It could just be done for, now sound symbolic purposes is the wrong term, something like um, mm -hmm. highlighting, highlighting purposes, or maybe Martin has it, or someone has a better term for it. Um, you know, it, it makes the word stand out, I would say. Yes, and my impression um, when, when living there and learning the language, what, it felt to me like there was a certain playfulness about right. um, like the, the Tsigi Meton and the Kidzi Meton. Um, and, but it was interesting that they didn't seem to be aware that they were switching the forms. But um, yeah, that's something to look into more. Appreciate that. Did you have another comment about diachronic? Uh, well, mainly that, it, you know, of course, it's very hard to prove. So yes. one way to, you know, some of your, you know, 
like when you had arm, you included words like armpit and hoof, and then in leg, you also had hoof, uh, navel and lung. That, some of those were a bit far for me. So if you just yeah. threw in, I don't know, Zuni and Uralic and, you know, some completely unrelated languages <laughs> with your same, you know, kind of any coronal, any dorsal, anything near a foot, <laughs> you know, would you find a similar amount of, you know, findings? on right. languages you still have zero potential to be connected yes i'm sure statistically so, i would find some right that's, that, yes it's, yeah so it yeah <laughs> but that's why I agree, it's hard to i agree see. that that that's a methodological um issue that i need to deal with um again i think i think i have i am observing a real pattern but then the real hard work comes in and figuring out what's what's plausible and legitimate in this. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. Oh, there we go, Martin. Hi, Martin. Yes, hi, Carol, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, I, 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 I am very happy that uh, that the Bonnie uh, posed that question because uh, she formulated it a thousand times better than I would have. <laughs> about uh, uh, I also had the feeling that with this, uh, these, these to do something intensively, and I might have similar uh, examples in the, in in the West West languages. Um, where you have also, um, yeah, kind of expressive words where uh, for things that are nice, things that are, that are left in the pot um, when you cook something <clears throat> occasionally. But um, on, on the diachronic side, yes, I, 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 I would. I would try to to limit rather than to find more and more and more. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> to me, if you have a in 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 your uh, first or last column a cognate in ik, then then you have to make a choice and 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 think, okay, which one of the ik forms do I want to relate to the other forms? Or if you see two forms that are seem to be closer like what you had for body i think then then i would think okay uh let us assume that that is a separate set and 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 mm -hmm. uh, and, and try to it's nice that you have all these candidates but then try to look for recurring languages you had northern agao a few times and then yes. possibly also for recurring um you, you know correspondences because right. what I really liked about your uh, presentation here that you showed uh, that that there is this thing going on in Ake and in Turkana and and that so it is not just a random trick to to connect words but that there is something <laughs> yeah. essential there yeah and and that was very good in the Turkana uh, example Gerrit had quite some restrictions and uh, you have to when you connect when you, when you connect these words but you not 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 necessarily for the vowels as far as i could see right so maybe 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 also think about um whether the need to be a restriction in in what kind of variation you allow in the vowels mm -hmm. okay i appreciate that martin I'm making note. And Samuel. Hi, Sam. Hi, Terrell. Thanks. This is always a lot of fun just to see the just vast array of possibilities. Um, I'm curious if you've tried clading off some of your, when you have 30 different possible related forms, have you tried to identify groups of those words that 
seem to have a closer history with each other than with other ones. Um, whether that's as part of an accepted language family inheritance or as like geographically nearby languages that seem to have borrowed. Um, I'm wondering if you've, you've like clustered any of your possible relations um, and if that might help move towards a historical interpretation. Thank you, Sam. I, I have done a bit of that on the fly. I haven't, you know, taken a lot of time to, to really work on that intensively. But for example, with the, 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 the root for worm and insect, I could do that for, for example, nilotic and break that into Eastern nilotic. Um, there does seem to be some clustering there that I could relate historically. And then also with, like Martin said, Northern Agao, it looks like there's some quite, quite uh, systematic correspondences there that would lend um, themselves to a historical interpretation. So I think that's the next step really, um, as well as getting more data from all of the proto-language reconstructions that are, that are available yeah. and work, working at that level. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, Martin, I'll just make one comment about what you said and about choosing, you know, choosing one, if it has more than one possible connection, choosing one and sticking with that. I think that's the right thing to do. My question is, why can't both of the different ick forms um, be cognate in if in the long history of hundreds and thousands of years that these things have been uh, happening in cycles and iterations where, you know, let's say that the ick word for foot looks, you know, if I choose to go with that one, it looks like a cognate with such and such forms in these languages. And the ick word for hoof looks cognate with different forms in different languages but they all could stem from an original form, meaning foot or part of foot or whatever it was back then. But because the in in modern ik today the forms look quite different, it's because they perhaps entered a Kuliak language um, at some point in history, and another one entered at a very different point in history. So that's what I'm thinking, like in a deep time depth. But to to prove any of that or to demonstrate it, I'll need to do what you're saying, which is pick one and tell its story, and then work um, worry about connecting the different stories into a bigger story later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fine. I had a comment on my earlier comment when I asked if an intentional inversion was metathesis. It occurs to me it could have originated as metathesis, like your nuclear nuclear example. Mm. But now, like if I said nuclear, that's sociolinguistically different. It's saying that I'm I have a certain political stance or a certain <laughs> education level or something. Yes. You know, it, it's become colored in a certain way, and so mm -hmm. some of these variant forms you know that have may have become lexically fossilized in a, in a sense even if they sprang up through the same phonological yes. mechanism maybe not an intentional mechanism like you right. said people not having awareness of it okay so that's yeah. another possibility mm -hmm. thank you and that reminds me of something i i forgot is that i know the ick uh, intentionally change their language when in the company of hostile people that yeah. have started learning their language. So they've been, you know, sociologically um, invested in keeping their language foreign. I never thought to consider whether inverting common nouns may be a strategy for that. And, mm -hmm. and an explanation for why it might get borrowed. A word might get borrowed in the in yes. form. That, yeah, I think you have a lot to do with the synchronic story here to set yes. the basis for, you know, and that sounds like even more than one paper at this point now. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it needs to be a book at some point. Yeah. Okay, Martin. Yeah, reaction to 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 that. I I like the um, Bonnie's suggestion of you know intentional swapping, um, because you have to explain in a way why the same speakers don't don't notice any difference between two forms mm -hmm. uh, when it occurs automatically, and they do notice it when they do it in in Bonnie terms intentionally, mm -hmm. and that the intention would explain why they would notice. Right. And otherwise, it's something to 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 explain why why it one 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 time it's not noticeable and the other time it is. Yes, exactly. And then from there, what's happening synchronically, like uh, Bonnie was saying, there's some process whereby these forms get lexicalized. Yeah. And once they're lexicalized then maybe that is the beginning of semantic changes over time. Sure, yeah. Synchronically in the lexicon, do you notice this pattern of a preference for dorsals initially or for voice consonants initially? Just, I don't Just know, in I general? Think. Yeah. That's something I have not looked at, but my initial feeling is that uh, I wouldn't find that kind of a preference. But a lot of the eek words are a single syllable, so maybe this would only be something. For, yeah, um, a lot words. of nouns are are CVC or or CVCVC, but a lot are CVC. Yeah, so if you ignored those and looked at the longer ones, I wonder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a good thing to look at um, if I can develop this further. But you might have to have a right take out the uh, nilotic loan words and then. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is like 70%. So, yeah, that's a little rough. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the nilotic groups that they were in contact with, would they have had any? We don't know if they might have had similar language hiding practices of, you know, manipulating the forms. So, the Tur like Turkana, Topos, and Karamajong. Mm -hmm. um, for at least a while, well, actually, I, I don't know. I don't know at what point they may have been um, the ones with less power in a inter, you know, inter-ethnic dispute. I mean, the ick have less power, or I should say they are more threatened by conflicts with the Turkana because the Turkana are, um, they are, they're armed and they are more aggressive as pastoralists. Um, so they wouldn't have, actually, I don't know. Maybe they would have different reasons to obscure their speech because the ick, by and large, are bilingual. So I've always assumed that the ick had a reason to obscure their speech, but perhaps the Turkana would have the same reason, <laughs> which is to not let the ick know what they're saying. But going back farther, I, I don't know when um, these groups, like the Tessa Turkana groups, would. Hmm, I don't know. When when do we all have reasons for wanting to speak a secret language? Well, I've just been reading a book about Rotwelch right now, which uh, I can't remember the title. I have to go go find it. Um, and that yeah it talks about obscuring forms in front yeah. of others yeah but you know as a as an in-group language mm -hmm. not necessarily for not necessarily for criminal purposes but also sometimes for that yes well parents often also do it um with their children so that children will understand what they're saying yes but there's there I appreciate all of your comments because I can see now there's a lot of avenues to go down um, beyond etymology, although that's been my focus. And um, the question of how it got words like guts for worm and sick for bee, 
it could be that they wanted to obscure what they were talking about. Maybe they were talking about where some honey was in the forest and they didn't want their neighbors to know what they were talking about and they switched it. I think like well, with Sam's comment about what's the historical scenario really that you're proposing, this is sort of like what is the sociolinguistic scenario you're proposing? Yes. Kind of two parts of the same question, not just here's a bunch mm -hmm. of words that look related, but exactly how, how did that come about? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And that is, that's really my, you know, that's really what I want to find out. Right. Are there any more questions or comments? If not, then I think, suggest we wrap up for today. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley uh, Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Uh, looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 30th of November. It will be presented by Stanislav Beletsky, and it is titled An Overview of Verbal Morphology of Ihan Zhu. And with that, I would like to thank Terrell again for his presentation and everyone else for participating today, and I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.